good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. I'm excited to see what God is going to say to us this evening. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you, Father, because we realize that you sit high, but you look low. You, you bless who you will bless, Father. We are grateful for the blessings that you have given us. We're thankful for life. We're thank you for, thankful for health. We're thankful for a, a sound mind. Now, God, we ask that you would bless this effort at uh, studying, learning of you, Father. You told us to learn of you. Uh, we're attempting to learn of you. We need you to open up our hearts and open up our minds and expand our thinking and take the limits off of uh, what we see in a worldly way. Uh, let the Spirit reveal to us what He's saying to the church. Oh God, we thank you for this day. Bless our pastor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad we made it another week. You know, we made it another week. Everybody didn't make it another week. It seems like just yesterday, we were here, it was Wednesday, but there were a lot of people who did not wake up. There were a lot of people who went in hospitals and did not come out. There are a lot of things that have happened to a lot of people and it did not happen to us. We thank God for his grace and his mercy. Last week, last week we talked about salvation. Last week we talked about the simplicity of the gospel message that, that, that salvation is by faith and faith alone. That it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how hard you pray. It doesn't matter how much you give. That's not going to save you. It's not by works. It's not by your sing, singing. It's not by your religiousness. It's not how pious you are, how, how well you sit, or how good you dress. Salvation, salvation, being reconciled back to God is by faith and faith alone. Believing that Jesus was the Son of God, that he came to earth, that he was crucified, and most of all, that he rose again. Salvation. This week, now I'm saved. I've been born again. I'm a new creature. We want to talk about Christian characteristics. Christian characteristics. If you would, open your Bibles to a familiar uh, passage of scriptures. Matthew, the, the, the fifth chapter of the first book in the New Testament. Matthew 5. Beginning at verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil falsely against you for his sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So for, for so persecuted, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Christian characteristics. This pericope of scripture 
comes from what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' ministry began in Galilee. I always think it's good to examine the landscape, the context, the, the, the reason for being for the scripture. You, you know, Israel was, during the time of Jesus, a conquered country. While they had crossed over the Jordan River with Joshua, and God had given them multiple victories, multiple uh, triumphs, they had great warriors like Saul and David and even his son Solomon, and, and, and they had a great time, and they were looked at as the richest and most prosperous and a great representation of God. By this time, by the time of Jesus, they were conquered. Rome had come in, and Rome was the conquering country. They were subject and under the thumb of Tiberius, the emperor of Rome. But, but it was Rome's manner to allow a country when they conquered it. And you know, Rome ruled the world. The known world at this time, but it was Rome's manner to allow a country to have a level of self autonomy. So, so while Rome was the conquering country and Rome was the final say, they allowed Israel and the Jews to rule themselves as long as they stayed inside of uh, Roman rule. So Israel had a king, Herod. Herod was king during this time, a high priest, Cyprus. Israel had a council, the Sanhedrin council, that was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees believed in life after death. Sadducees didn't believe in life after death. But the real truth of the matter is this council, uh, the high priest and the king itself, had become corrupt. The people who were ruling the Jews had to come corrupt and be subject to, to Rome. And, and Rome just wanted everything to be calm. Rome just wanted them to keep everything under control. And, and so as long as they kept everything under control, there was no problem. But with their corruption, they started taxing the people. They started overcharging the people for, for all types of things. They, they started taking advantage. The Sanhedrin and the, the Sanhedrin Council, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, was filled with nepotism, was filled with, with brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and rich folks who bought their way into a position, and their primary purpose was to maintain status quo, for, to, to, to enrich themselves for selfish natures. And, and you know, it's time for us to go vote. And, and we really need to hold those who rule over us that we elect and put in place accountable. Because what has happened over time in an effort to maintain status quo and just get reelected, we seem to have suffered, we seem to suffer from corrupt corruption in politics. So it's time to take it seriously when it's time to go vote. What happens politically affects our everyday life. So, so, so that's the landscape. They need to keep everything in order. They need to keep it calm, not have no issues. And, 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 the, and the truth is, the people hated being under Roman subjugation. They couldn't stand. They, 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 they were waiting for this promised Messiah. They, they were looking for a king, but, but just like normal people, they, they wanted to return to what has been. They were looking for a, a mighty warrior. They were looking for a Saul. They were looking for a, a David. Somebody was going to come in, overthrow Rome, put things right, and put Israel back to where it was supposed to be, the, the jewel of, of the world. Everybody looking at them and, and, and wishing that was them in their country. And, but we have a, a promise from God of, of, of a savior. Of, of a king, a, a messiah, 
and 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 he, this this Messiah, this King, uh, his world, his, his his kingdom was not of this world. His his kingdom, he he was on a different mission. His mission wasn't to restore worldly triumph. His mission was to reconcile man back to his father. That this Jewish preacher, we we've heard the story, born in Bethlehem, right? But but his family was from Nazareth in Galilee. It, you know what's that saying? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You, you know. They didn't like Nazareth. The Jews didn't like Nazareth. Even today, when I looked up Nazareth, in Israel, it's 99.2% error. Jews don't live in Nazareth today. But Jesus came out of Nazareth. He came out of Nazareth, and, 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 and the thing about Jesus was, you know, his ministry began, as, as we all know, at, at the, the wedding. Where his mother said, hey, they ran out of wine. I need you to help them. And he said, my time has not come. Yeah. But, but to honor his mother, he began his ministry. And his first miracle was the changing of the water to wine. Now, now, now the one thing we need to know and always remember, that began his march to the cross. And, and, and one thing, you know, let me share with you the cross. Crucifixion. I, I don't know if you're like me, but as a young man and as a kid, I, I thought perhaps Jesus was the only one that hung on the cross. That that, that was a special, something special that they, they did to Jesus. But, but crucifixion was the common execution. It wasn't nothing nice about crucifixion. And, 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 and we need to understand that Jesus understood that his walk he was a disruptor. He was going to disrupt status quo. His walk led to that cross. A cross where they stripped you naked. Where they nailed nails into your feet. It's actually into the area right above your feet. Cross one leg over the other and nailed you to the cross. Nailed you right here in your in your wrist to a cross, naked. And then you die. And it took time to die. And then you die. It, it was an embarrassment. It was, it was a shameful way to go. And, 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 and so starting this ministry, how long was Jesus' ministry altogether? Three years. It began when he was 30. To his crucifixion at 33. Three years. In three years, Jesus changed the world. Here's a young Jewish preacher from a, from a, from a poor family, from a town that nobody liked, that held the Roman, local Roman garrison, so they thought all the people in Nazareth were snitches and pro Roman. And here's this young Jewish preacher starts preaching. He starts preaching in Galilee. And he starts healing people. And people start getting uh, repentant. And, and lame start walking. Eyes open up. His fame started to grow. And, and, and people were following him. And, and, and what happened is uh, the Jewish leaders started following him too. Because he was a disruptor. He was a threat. He was a threat to their situation that they had now. And, 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 and so it's in that context, it's in that, that, that environment that we see this Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount wasn't about salvation. The Sermon on the Mount was about a way of life, how to live. The Sermon on the Mount is life instructions for those who have responded to the message of repent and be saved. You know, my opinion, this Bible, there's one thing in the Bible for the unsaved, that's repent and be saved. The rest of the Bible is how do we live as Christians, as saved people, as children of God in an unsaved world? And how do we live with each other? How do we treat each other? How does the house of God 
get along? How, how do we get along? What do I do when, when you offend me? We both are the same tree. The Bible gives us instructions for living, and the Sermon on the Mount is about character. Beatitudes, we've all heard about them. We all know what they are, blessed are this, blessed are that, which is what we're going to work with. Beatitudes set the tone for this Sermon on the Mount. This sermon starts in chapter 5, and it runs through chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. He took his time. The emphasis of the Sermon on the Mount is the hu humility of man and the righteousness of God. Beatitudes, blessed are, are not so much a blessing as they are a state of blessedness. You are that blessed person because of your character. So when it says blessed are, it's talking about you're already in that spot. These are, these beatitudes are truly instructions about how to find favor with God. You want to know how to get favor? Adapt yourself to these beatitudes. These Beatitudes are promises. They're for each of these characteristics, for each of these uh, methods of character that you achieve, there's a promise attached to it. And you know, God doesn't break his promise. Let, let, let's, let's start at the beginning of the chapter, Matthew, uh, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes... He went up into a mountain, and when he was set, come, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught him, saying, what, what, what do I get out of here? And seeing the multitude, he saw the work. He saw the need. And seeing the multitude. Sometimes we have to pay attention to what's going around us. We need to see the work. It's around us all the time. And then it says he went up into a mountain. He went to a high place. We see the work. We see the need. But it's time to get set apart. Get ourselves right. Get meditate. Get in God. And get prepared to address the need of God's people. And then when he was set. He, it, it doesn't say he just jumped on in. He went to a high place. He got away. He went up into a mountain. And, and when he was set, he got himself together. He got ready. His, then, then he brought in his support. His disciples came and sat around him. He had his back up. He, he, he was cut. He got comfortable. He, was, he, 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 he got his support in. And then it says he opened his mouth and talked them, saying, He saw the need. He went to a high place. He prepared himself. He had his support team close, and then he took action. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Matthew 5 and 3. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When you're poor in spirit, I have, it's a recognition that I have nothing to offer God. It's a state of complete humility, no arrogance. You know, they say the definition of arrogance is thinking that it's you and not God. Mm -hmm. The definition of humility is always remembering that it's all about God. Yeah. I have nothing to offer God. The poor in spirit, he has everything to give me. Yeah. Poor in spirit is recognition of my sinful condition. And my desire for God's grace. I'm spiritually bankrupt before God. And I come to him as an empty cup. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What do the poor in spirit get? The kingdom of heaven. What that saying is if you come that way, you get saved. 
Matthew 5 and 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not only am I poor in spirit, not only do I recognize my wretchedness before God, but I'm sorry about it. I'm sorry about it. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief leads to death. To mourn means to experience deep grief. This mourning is due to grief over sin. That puts us in place in a place of promise. He promised to send us a comforter. That comfort is the Holy Spirit and that he would be with us forever. He tells us that in John. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that are in the right position to allow God to come in and do what he does with no arrogance and no, no resistance. Matthew 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. What is meek? Meek is defined. Meek, you know, if you meek is defined as, as quiet, gentle, resigned, somebody that you can take advantage of, something. Uh, you know, they, they don't stand up for themselves, they're easily imposed on. Now, if you grew up like I grew up, the last thing you were taught was to be meek. You were taught to fat, fight back. You were taught to always stand up for yourself. Never allow anybody to disrespect you. But here this is saying that I need to have as a character, as a Christian, meekness. But see the Bible, the Greek word used in the Bible for meek is praesis. And, and praesis is humility towards God and towards others. Having the power to do something, but I refrain from it for your benefit. That's what Christian meekness is. I could knock you out, but I'd rather see you say I could cuss you out, but I'd rather not be a stumbling block and allow you to see God in me. That's Christian meekness. This is how we're supposed to treat each other. I tell Adrian all the time, we need to give each other a break, especially those of the house of God. It's all right if they're wrong. It's all right if they treated you uh, in a way that you weren't happy with. It's all right if they didn't do what you thought they should do. Let's pray. Let's pray for them. And, and let's hold them to a higher standard. Let's encourage them. And then let's stand back and see what God do. It's amazing when you stand back and see what God do as, all, as opposed to always getting in the way. Having the power, meekness. Having the power to do something and not doing it. Ephesians 4, 1 through 2, 1, 1 and 2 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, urge us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. We are talking about the Son of God who, who submitted himself to the humiliation of the cross when he had power to raise people from the dead for the benefit of humankind. Christ, Christ, that's weakness. That's me. I'm powerful, but I ain't got to do it. With all, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing one another in love. Uh, Matthew 5 and 6. Blessed are those, blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, blessed, blessed. There are, if you get in this position, then God sees you as blessed. How do you get in this position? Blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they should be filled. I don't know about you when, 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 when I come to God. 
I need to know all I can. I, I, I need to seek him with my whole heart. You know, I, I, I need to know as much as I can about, about this, this, this God, this, this God, because I recognize that there's got to be a God. And when I come to God, and now, now, now I've, I've submitted my life, and, and I'm a Christian, now, now I want to be as right as possible. You get saved based on what you believe. But once you believe that, the spirit in you should change your desires and make you want to be right. You hunger and thirst after righteousness. How do we do that? Priority, we put God first. In everything we do, we put God first. Second is we practice it. They used to say practice makes perfect, right? Well, 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 the one thing I know for sure is I'm not going to do everything right. But what happens is I have the Holy Spirit and when I do something wrong, it convicts me. It pricks my conscience. And I don't have to go back and do it again. I can repent. And the next time I'm in that same scenario, that same situation, I have the opportunity to do it the right way. I get to practice it. I practice it. And then I take it personal. Priority, we put God first. Practice is I, I, it's a matter of how I live and how I walk. And then, then, it, then I take it personal. It's personal to me that I want to be right before God. It's personal to me. I know that I can't be righteous on my own. But with the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus, God will see me as righteous. Amen. Matthew 5 and 7. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy comes from the heart that has felt its own spiritual bankruptcy. Mercy comes from the heart that has felt its own spiritual bankruptcy. Mercy is the withholding of just punishment. Titus 3 and 5 says he saved us. Not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is what I think all the time. How many times did I ask God to forgive me for the same thing? Over and over and over. Over. At the end of the day, he forgave me. Not only that, he had to cast it into the sea of forgiveness, forgetfulness, and allow me to just walk with a new stuff. He has mercy. If God, if Jesus could forgive those who, you know, you know, think about it. They, they arrested him. Illegally, according to Jewish law. They marched him around and judged him, made him look bad. His disciples ran off and left him. It was so bad, the Roman emperor said, I don't see no fault in him. Why don't we let him go? And the people said, give me Barabbas, a thief. But Jesus still forgave them. Still went to that cross and died for them. Still had mercy. Then we get to what I think might be my favorite of these Beatitudes. Might be uh, Matthew 5 and 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Greek word used for pure is catharsis. It means clean. It means blameless. It means unstained from guilt. And, and, and while I'm at it, you know, the, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And the New Testament is written in Greek. And sometimes you need to go look at the word they use to find out what they're really trying to say. Because we read it as, from a worldly perspective, but we need to see it from a spiritual perspective. Well, katharos, that same word, is used to describe that which has been purified by fire. Or that which has been pruned. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been 
uh, in the fire of purification. I've been in that fire. I've had trouble. I, I, I've been in a position where the only thing I can say is, please God, help me. I, I know what the fire of life feels like, and I understand what it means to get on the other side, and then no question I've been prone. I can't tell you the things that God has cut out. In, in, in Isaiah, what did he say? In the year that King Uzziah died, then I saw the Lord. Sometimes things have to be cut out of your life. So, you know, you know, we have such worldly expectations and, 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 and we don't really get into the mind and will of God. We live and exist based on God's will. We, we live at the pleasure of God. He created us purely for his pleasure. He didn't need us. But then we get mad at God when he takes something out of our life. Sometimes he got to move something out of your life in order for you to see him. Amen. That person, that thing, served its purpose in your life. So what's my prayer? My prayer is God allow me to be in my assignment. So if that assignment is just to say, to smile at somebody that gives them some hope so that they move from one state of existence to the next state of existence. If that's my assignment in life, I believe that you live to complete your assignment. Blessed are the pure in heart. Katharos. Katharos. Uh, purified by fire. Purified by pruning. It, when, when you've been purified that way, you, the, your character is one that God says is a blessed place to be. Then the word for heart, cardia, refers not to this. It's used for this too, but it refers to your spiritual center of life, where you live at, your thoughts, your desires, your sense of purpose, the area where your character resides. Pure in heart means being real about it, being transparent, having uh, good intentions. Sometimes things go wrong, but your intent was good, pure in heart. Psalms 51 and 10, Psalms of David, creating me a clean heart, renewing me a right spirit. I pray that all the time. Creating me. You know, there's some people, as I live this life, I, I, I recognize that some people, that, 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 that some people want to do good, and some people don't. Some people sit around and think about what they can do to cause you trouble. What they can do to get ahead of you. That's on their mind. And then, and then there's people who think about how to be the best they can be. And, and what can they do to advance you. Pure in heart. Pure intentions. In the message version it says... For pure in heart, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Then, 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 and, and you know, we're not going to be a whole lot longer. Matthew 5 and 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. A peacemaker is someone who reconciles people with God and with one another. Peacemaking is not passive. And, and you know, we've been taught to mind our own business. Peacemakers are the opposite of mind your own business. And, and, and what we're really talking about here is in the house of God. In the house of God. We can't just sit back and let it fall apart. Peacemakers take the initiative to get involved in conflicts with the intention of building bridges with people at odds. Hebrews 12, 14 through 16 in the message version says, work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. Make sure no one gets left out. Look, listen to this. Make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. Keep a sharp out for, eye out for weeds of bitter discontent. It only takes discontent from one or two to ruin the whole scenario. 
Matthew 5 and 10 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. I always thought this said for my sake. But this says for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Once again, here's a beatitude that the promise is salvation. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the message version says you're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you into a, a deeper into God's kingdom. And, and once again, I want to emphasize that these beatitudes are not you're going to be blessed when this happens. It means that when you're in this character, when this is part of your character, you have favor with God. You are blessed. You are blessed. 1 Peter 2 and 20 says, For what credit is it if when you sin and you're beaten for it, you endure it? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, that's a gracious thing in the sight of God. Anybody ever had false witness, been blamed for something they did not do? You know how unfair that feels. God looks at you graciously when you're in that position. It says not only that, message version, for 11 and 12. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit Jesus. What that means is the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, God says he does. And all heaven applauds. And you know you are in good company because his prophets and witnesses have always gotten into that kind of trouble. Back to King James, blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Revile you, that sounds, that's a strong word. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted the prophets which were before you you know that's the beatitude that's those uh, statements of character at the beginning of the greatest sermon ever preached on, on, on the mountain in front of the multitude with his disciples at his feet by this Jewish preacher from the town of Nazareth that's the greatest sermon ever preached and, and, and in this sermon, he tells us that there's rewards. Did you know that you get a reward? That, 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 that Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. There's a law of sowing and reaping. It's a law. It has to happen. It says, For one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, because in due season we will reap yes. the law of sowing and reaping. Hebrews 6 and 10, talking about rewards. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. He, he, he ain't just seeing you trying to put this together and to put on the, the body of Christ and let the mind of Christ be in you. He's not seeing you do this and not recognizing it. God is not unjust to over, ask to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name serving the saints. Then 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us, you know, for some people, that's a scary time. That's not a scary time for Christians. That's reward time. That's where we go get our crown. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the Bible, whether good or bad. Rewards. Crowns. There's five crowns. Anybody ever heard of crowns? There's five crowns. The first crown I want to talk about, the first reward, the first benefit for sowing and reaping, the first benefit for, for being in Christ, the incorruptible crown. 
1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you know that in a race all runners run? But only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. That's, that's what we're doing now, this strict training. They do it for a crown that will not last. That's the world. But we do it for a crown that will last forever. The incorruptible crown is a crown that you get for your self-discipline. The incorruptible crown is a crown that you get for walking uh, circumspect to the world. That's, your, that, that's, an additional, that's an additional reward that you will get. How many of you really believe in heaven? Heaven is a real place. They, they got rooms in heaven. They got thrones in heaven. They got angelic bodies in heaven. They got elders in heaven. When I read my Bible, I see descriptions of heaven. It even says how big it is. When my mother passed, I, I went to study and where is she going? You, you know what I'm saying? My mother, my mother went to heaven. I wanted to know where she was going to be. So, so I got my Bible out and, and started a study on where my mother was going. Second crown is the crown of righteousness. First Timothy 4 and 6. For I am now ready to be offered. We know this is Paul talking. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good faith. I want that to, I have fought a good fight. I want that to be my testimony. I have finished my course. I completed my assignment. I have kept the faith. I didn't punk out. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only. It wasn't just for Paul, but for everyone, but unto them that love that also love Jesus and his appearing. This is the, the crown that, that we get for completing our assignments on earth. When you, I, I, I don't know if, if you know what your assignment is, but, but, but in your spirit, you should be able to discern your assignment. I'm in my assignment. My, my assignment is help. My assignment is support. I know what my assignment is. I, I don't know how long this assignment lasts, if this is the one that lasts forever, but I'm in my assignment. No question about it. Amen. The crown of righteousness. I'm trying to get all, I'm trying to get at least four crowns, okay? <laughs> there's one crown I'm trying to see if I'm eligible for. <laughs> uh, then there's the crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 19. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? He's talking, this is Paul talking to the church in Thessalonica. The church that he evangelized. Indeed, you are our crown in glory. This is the evangelist crown. This is that crown that you get for bringing people to Christ. This is the evangelist crown. Then, 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 then we get to, hi, pastor, how you doing? But we get to the crown that, that for sure you get. The crown of glory. Peter, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. To the elders among you. Now, that's when I started thinking, maybe that's me too. <laughs> to the elders among you, I appeal as a follow, as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering. Who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that are under your care. Watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording over those entrusted to you. You know, some pastors are just hard on their flock. Not lording over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd comes, you will receive a crown, a crown of glory that will never fade away. This is the shepherd's crown. And, 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 and then there's this last crown. 
That if you believe in Jesus, if, if you think that, if you know that Jesus died for your sins, if you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, the crown of life. James 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to all them that love him. Be faithful unto death, and God will give you his crown. This crown of life it is available to all them who cry, please save me. This crown of life is available. This crown of life that when your day comes and you have to stand before the judgment seat, and Jesus looks at you and, 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 and he rewards you. Maybe you didn't get the crown of glory. Maybe you didn't get the incorruptible crown. But, but, but if, of all the crowns, I got to at least get this one. I got to at least get this one. I got to get this crown of life. I want to walk around heaven with my crown of life. And you know you see them boxers when they become unified? And they got several belts. Yeah, that's what I, I want crowns. <laughs> I want crowns. So, so I'm going to work out my soul's salvation. You know, it's, 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 it's an opportunity. It's, it, it's an honor to be able to stand before uh, God's people and say anything about moving forward in God. We want to take this opportunity to, to invite those of you who may not have this crown of life promised yet. Amen. Who may not, who may not have opened up their heart and recognized that Jesus saves. Amen. Who may be somewhere trying to get right so they can get saved. Now get saved and get right. Amen. You ain't got to change nothing. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is let the spirit that's knocking on your door. And Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. All you have to do is let the spirit that's knocking on your door. And believe that Jesus died for your sins and God rose him from the dead. And thou shalt be saved. I, I invite you, if you're watching online, to type salvation. The type salvation. And, and, and I promise you, our pastor will contact you and pray with you. And we will work with you. You ain't got to get right. You got to get saved. And, and, and then you can join us as a church family. You can tap, you can type, you can type on your computer, all in. Hashtag all in. I got that right? Amen. Okay, hashtag all in. And join us. This is good ground. This is a great pastor. This is a moving ministry. You know how I know? Because the Bible says you can tell a tree by its fruit. And since I've been here, it's true. It's true. The, the tree is in full bloom. Join us. Join us. Thank you. For this evening. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. Oh God, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your, for your son Jesus, Father. We thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, Father. We just ask that you would visit us, that you would renew us, that you would restore us, that you would create in us a clean heart. Remove anything that, that isn't like you, that doesn't allow us to, to be salt doesn't allow us to be the light of the world. That doesn't attract. Remove anything. Oh God, we praise you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you so much.